pray together. We lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving to thee this day anew, our Father in heaven, as we think upon thee and upon thy wonderful ways in dealing with us, the sons of men, yea, those who have rebelled against thee even. We think upon thy marvelous grace which was given to us before the beginning of time in Christ Jesus, that grace which has uh, now been revealed in the appearing of the Lord Christ as the one who has come to destroy death and bring uh, life and immortality to light through the gospel. We thank thee for him. We thank thee for his appearing. We thank thee for the uh, wisdom and the power and the grace manifested in his uh, saving life, his active and passive obedience in our behalf. We pray, O Lord, that we may be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ this day, that we might, uh, as those who are called to minister the gospel, uh, be prepared to endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may be rejoicing with us in thy saving power and uh, the eternal hope which is ours in Christ Jesus. So help us to give ourselves as uh, faithful stewards in uh, these days and uh, the, the hours that are available to us, the opportunities at this place uh, to be studying the scriptures together, to be meditating upon uh, the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray thou that uh, this day that thy spirit would again be with us to build us up in that faith, to brighten the, the hope and the joy that is uh, within us, to set our hearts more firmly upon those invisible things, those things which are not seen but are eternal even in the heavens at thy right hand. Mm -hmm. So lift us up in our spirits, we pray thee this day, and uh, make us to be a blessing one to the other through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, our subject is the uh, Hosea 1 through 3. There are the three cycles in uh, which uh, each one has uh, two sections dealing with the old covenant, its uh, breaking of the covenant and the, the covenant judgment. But each of the three cycles also then concludes with a, a prophetic vision of the new covenant described in terms of prophetic idiom. Uh, setting forth the, the work and the blessings of Christ in terms of a whole uh, sequence of uh, Old Testament episodes uh, from uh, the, the Exodus right up to the restoration uh, from Babylon, uh, all of them. I, of course, as we're insisting uh, <coughs> typological symbols for their anti-typical corresponding uh, uh, features in uh, the New Covenant. <coughs> well, in doing that, we, we went through the first cycle and uh, pretty much, I guess, through to the second cycle, which uh, comprises chapter 2-4 through the end of that chapter. Now, I think then we were finishing up uh, the concluding portion <coughs> of the second cycle where the new covenant is being set forth. And we had uh, seen how the passage is structured uh, into paragraphs uh, signalized by the recurring of that word Lachain, verily, verily. And uh, we had gone through th those sections. We had seen how the, uh, the, the judgment had been uh, portrayed in terms of the removal of two things, the removal of Baalism uh, <coughs> and, and the removal of prosperity, the removal of Baalism uh, as an act of judgment in the sense that uh, the, the Israelites wanted to uh, continue to uh, uh, go to the Baal festivals and so on, but they would be uh, frustrated in exile. They would be cut off <coughs> from access to that. So the, the exile then uh, is uh, defined in terms of the separation of God's people from the theocratic land and, and all of the the, the institutions and the benefits uh, of that land, uh, and all of its prosperity and so on. And uh, in, indeed, as a, a total rupture of, of <coughs> the covenant, as, as uh, brought out in the name Lo Ami, not my, my uh, people, not just Jezreel, a place of judgment, not just Lo Ruhama, without the mercy, but the Lo Ami, uh, a, a total uh, discontinuance of the God people uh, relationship. And now those two ideas, the removal of Baalism, the removal of prosperity, then are, have their counterpart in the section on 
on blessing that we are uh, looking at the, the new covenant section because now the removal of realism is reiterated now no longer as a matter of frustration uh, of, of their designs and desires to engage in the, the fertility cult but uh, now as a matter of purification so they will be <coughs> purified and the, the very mention of the idolatrous Baalim will be removed from their mouth and instead of the removal of prosperity its counterpart is the in introduction of full scale pro uh, prosperity and indeed, uh, the, the, the final little section that we're coming to will be uh, uh, underscoring that aspect of it. And, uh, well, we come with, uh, I guess, uh, verse uh, uh, 12, uh, is it, uh, to the uh, section which uh, no longer then is being introduced so much by the word Lacane, but by this... Uh, triple repetition of the word for betrothal, which appears in your text then in the form wa'erashtika, from the verb arash, beginning with an alif, <coughs> and the other <coughs> PL perfect form here. <coughs> me. So the, and let's look at verse uh, 21. The preceding verses have uh, is spoken of his uh, cutting off uh, uh, the, the bow and the warfare and, and so on from the land and uh, the, the causing of the people to lie down securely, Levetai. <coughs> I think that's about as, uh, where we had uh, come to yesterday, was it not? Well then with uh, verse 21, you find that where Arash Tika, the, the Olam and so forth through that verse and then in verse uh, 22 uh, it is repeated. Uh, where's the third one I'm looking for here? And uh, uh, there are three of them. <coughs> it's repeated in 21. It's repeated in 21, thank you. Um, yeah, there it is, right. Let, let's uh, read then 21. Where Erashtika li le olam. Yeah, there there is, thank you. Uh, and then there it's repeated. Where Erashtika li. So God says, I will betroth you uh, to myself. And. <coughs> Now over against the uh, impermanence and uh, and uh, the uncertainty uh, of, of the old covenant due to the presence of uh, the, the works principle, uh, that there that the uh, new covenant will be one where permanence is is guaranteed and uh, fidelity in the marriage relationship uh, using the Hosea Gomer analogy. The, the Old Testament had been one that was characterized in the, in the part of Israel, the, the, the white, uh, by a total lack of, of, of fidelity and, 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 and enduring commitment. But the new covenant now is one uh, that will be marked by, and you get a whole series of, every word it, it seems that it could be enlisted here to bring out the thought of, of the, the stability of this arrangement and the permanence and, and the integrity of it is uh, is uh, listed here in connection with this triple repetition of Rashtika, I will betroth you to myself now then the, the first thing is the Olam forever the, the, this one uh, is uh, the one that will be uh, consummated indeed then the, the Rashtika repeated I will betroth you to me now you get other terms Zedek and, and Mishpat uh, and uh, the Zedek is, is the, the, the righteousness and uh, the, the idea of of fidelity and the mishpat and injustice, there will not be the breaking of covenant and going astray, but everything is done properly in the marriage relationship. And then he adds uh, further the term chesed, and uh, so much has been written about that term, which is uh, very often then translated uh, loving kindness, I guess, at least in the older version, the loving kindness or just the, uh, the, the love, but also then <coughs> it is suggested that uh, uh, the, the overtone of it, if not the, the essential primary meaning of the term chesed, is that of covenant faithfulness, which would be right on target here, you see, in terms of, of, of the stability of this marriage uh, relationship. It has its mutual commitments, which will be kept in, in, in chesed, in, chesed in, in, in covenant uh, faithfulness. And then there is also the term uh, which uh, picks up positively over against the Lord Ruhama name of of not will I have 
uh, mercy, uh, not will she have mercy, and you have the rachamim, in, in, uh, this is one of those things, at least in the text I have, where that, that last word in the sentence is, uh, is, uh, is jammed into the space above the, the line with a little bracket mark beside it, uh, rachamim, and, and with, uh, you know, with, with mercies again. And then in verse 22, we have the third appearance of, <coughs> uh, of the term, yea, I will betroth you to myself, and now emunah, another very powerful term, uh, you know, for the, that which is settled and firm. Uh, amen, amen, emunah, faithfulness. And uh, then it, it concludes with the, the phrase, we yadat, yadat et Yahweh. And uh, here again, I, I would say that uh, what we said earlier uh, <coughs> about the verb yada which uh, I guess where we saw it earlier, it was with the negative. Uh, they did, did thus, and, and, and so, and, and they, yeah, it was in connection with <coughs> the Lord's provision of, uh, of the usual commodities that were expected of a husband to provide for his wife, and the Lord had provided them, and the Israelites were attributing uh, these provisions to uh, all of the, the idols, and then it said, and they did not acknowledge their, the verb yada, the, they did not know the Lord, and I suggested there that we Try to say they would not acknowledge, and they would not acknowledge that the Lord was the source of all of these things. Now here we have the opposite of that. <coughs> Under the new covenant, we have it in its positive form, and uh, so yada, and they will now uh, make acknowledgement of of the Lord. And uh, going on then into verse 23, and <coughs> it shall be in that day that. I will answer Neum Yahweh, yea, uh, I will answer the heavens. I get this interesting sequence of, of one party answering another and then, then that party answering the next one. And, <clears throat> and you go down a, a prayer chain, as it were, from the Lord right down to the, the people uh, themselves uh, who are praying for, uh, for, for blessing. Uh, but it, it starts at the top of the chain where the Lord himself is the one who is finally answering the, the prayer for for the new covenant blessing and prosperity. And uh, so he says, I will answer. And um, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, Hashemayim. Now then as we reconstruct the thing, uh, the, the heavens meanwhile are being called upon by the earth uh, to bring down rain to fructify the earth but how can the heavens uh, do that of themselves uh, they are dependent on the Lord to trigger the mechanism so that the, 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 the rain will pour forth uh, from the chambers of heaven down upon the earth so the, the heavens uh, then have been calling upon the Lord uh, to do that and so he, he now is prepared to answer uh, that prayer of the heavens and then as I say you, you move along uh, the, the heavens in, in turn then will be in a position uh, to, with the, the rain cycle trigger, triggered by the Lord. The heavens will be in a position to answer the prayer of uh, the earth, which, uh, as it goes on to say, and they, referring to Hashemai and Haim, they will, uh, they will answer the earth. And what's the earth been uh, praying for? Well, of course, uh, for the supply of rain so that it can bring forth uh, the crops and the rain having fallen on them, heaven having, having answered the earth's prayer. Now we go on, verse 24, the earth is in a position now uh, to answer the prayer of the Dagan and the Tirosh and the Yitzhar of the grain and the wine and the oil. These, these crops are dependent upon the earth uh, to, uh, to, to feed them and they have been crying out to the earth for that nourishment and now the earth answers their prayer. And now these crops in, in, in turn are precisely uh, the, the, the fertility of the field and so on. It's precisely what the people of God have been praying for so now at last we come to the, the other end of the, the prayer chain with the people of God praying for the fruitful crops and the, and the crops are answering uh, them and they are now depicted as Jezreel. Huh? So the people of God are, are, are described now in terms of that name of the first child which we saw had, uh, was used in the double way. At the beginning used with a reference to the uh, historical uh, geographical Meaning where it uh, uh, it, uh, it br brought up thoughts of, of great sins in the past and great judgments, uh, but the other aspect of Jezreel, the positive side of it, uh, works with the etymology that it means God sows, and so here is the picture of God's people now as as the, 
the much blessed uh, people, numerous as the stars and so on, we already saw in the, the, the first uh, in the cycle and in, in the, the picture of the new covenant, the thought that they would be as numerous as the stars of the heaven and so on, that's what Jezreel would signify, the, the much blessed fruitful field sown by the, the Lord. And uh, so that's the designation for them again here, the people of God, the great people have been multiplied by the coming in of the Gentiles, as we know, uh, and uh, they will receive the blessings of, of the covenant. And now that is spelled out, that etymology of Jezreel is, uh, is spelled out then in verse 25, so what we were just saying becomes mm -hmm. now quite explicit when uh, God uses that verb Zara, in, found in Jezreel at the end of verse 24, and he promises, and I will sow her to myself in, in the land. So it's not just that there will be uh, fruitful provisions for them, but they themselves will be multiplied, huh? and, uh, and the name of Jezreel will come true then for them. I will sow her to myself in the land. And so there's one of the three names. And then the, the, the uh, second name, Lo Ruhama, finds its uh, answer here when, when God says that, uh, and I will have mercy now. I will have mercy upon the one who was previously Logokama. And then the third name is uh, also uh, alluded to uh, and the, in the promise that I will say to Lo Ami, Ami Ata, you are now uh, my people. And uh, he will say uh, to me, Elohai, my God. And uh, here again, then, we get the, the thought of the marriage commitments, the, the mutual. It, uh, recognition and acceptance of the husband and the wife to uh, one another, the God and and uh, the people. So it, it's the the recurring motif of, of the covenantal committing, which is what covenants are. They, they are these solemn commitments, these oath-bound commitments. And running through this passage, there is the thought then of how the people of God and the Lord himself uh, make those commitments one to the other and uh, so establish the, this marriage relationship. In terms of uh, uh, Old Testament uh, background uh, for that mutual uh, making of commitment, we are of course uh, uh, back at Sinai. huh? So we, we've had the exodus of the type of things we've seen and uh, other features of their life right down to the monarchy with David and, and, uh, and all of that. Uh, but uh, here again is the thought of what happened uh, at Sinai, the kind of thing that uh, Ezekiel uh, looks at and, and applies and in Ezekiel 16, for example, is not it? Uh, where Ezekiel takes the, the Sinai covenant making and, and, and uh, uses it, uh, uses the marriage relationship as an analogy to uh, depict what was going on there. All right, well, then that, that finishes the, the, the second cycle, and now we move on to the, the, the brief uh, but sort of climactic, uh, the third cycle in chapter 3 and uh, verses 1 through 5. The three sections, A, B, C. A would be the um, broken covenant, and, uh, and uh, that would be found in the description of, once again, of, of uh, Hosea's wife. So she is one who has uh, been unfaithful. So he, here is the reflection then of, of uh, what we found in the other A sections, the, the, the breaking of the covenant. And uh, then what we will find very rapidly, though, is that it moves into the, the, uh, the thought of judgment. Now let's uh, look at the, the third, uh, the first verse, and just raise the question which we really have taken for granted all along in our discussion of uh, Hosea's marriage, namely that it's uh, the same woman that's going to be involved here in chapter 3, who is involved in chapter 1, and uh, it's Gomer once again. Uh, but let's look at the language. Wayomer Yahweh, so the Lord now says unto me, and, and here we get uh, very much a repetition of the opening verses in, in chapter 1, and he used to go and take a wife. Uh, so the Lord now said unto me, once again, 
And I would uh, suggest that, that, that I think the usual way that the ode is taken, once again, is with what goes before it, isn't that the Lord said to me once again, but, but the Lord said to me, now once again, go and take away. So uh, the Lord now <coughs> said unto me, once again, Lake, go, and love is Shah. All right, we've seen several times along the way, I've uh, tried to point out to you how the word ish, man, is used in the specific sense of, uh, of uh, husband. And isha, woman, is used in a specific sense of, of uh, wife. And so it is here, uh, I, I would suggest. And uh, go then and, and love, and uh, you don't need the pronominal suffix necessarily, the, the, the wife, it's your wife, of course. Uh, the, the one whom he had married, who had been uh, unfaithful uh, to him, who had borne these uh, illegitimate uh, children, as we uh, uh, understood the, the language would suggest there. And uh, now she's been separated uh, from him. And uh, the, the question has been, uh, what's the nature of, of the, the, the break? And, uh, and did it come to a full-fledged divorce? Uh, uh, actually, between them. Well, let's hold that off and just try to establish, first of all, that, that uh, this is in, indeed uh, uh, Gomer. Yet go and, and love, and then the options would be a woman, some new woman, or, or your wife, who is then described as Ahuvat, which is a passive uh, cow participle, one who is loved of and uh, with the various textual uh, suggestions of, of change that are made along here, w w at this point some would want to uh, be repointing it as an active uh, participle uh, of Hevet, but uh, the, the text is a passive one. Here is someone, uh, a woman, who is described as being loved by someone, and the someone is, is, uh, is the rea. And now there's another then uh, cause for a uh, difference of opinion. Rea, rea could be uh, just some other lover of Paramour, uh, but uh, Rea is also used uh, for husband. Hmm? And uh, in Jeremiah 3.20, you might uh, check sometime, uh, the, the word Rea is used for husband. And that's the one, I, uh, I, as I see it, that fits here, which dis it's describing Gomer. And uh, she is one who all along has uh, been loved by Hosea, her husband, very faithfully. So he's been keeping his part, just as God has uh, always kept his part in, in uh, the covenant. And uh, so go now and, and love, love again, take, take in marriage again. Uh, this woman who can be described as one who was loved by her husband as Ho uh, Hosea had loved her, and yet and now you get this uh, P.O. participle from Na'af, and, and yet she has gone astray, and she has uh, committed adultery a a against him. And uh, parallel, of the, the, the analogy then is very, uh, very plain. It goes on to say, even as, oh, see, Hosea, you do this, even as the Lord has been loving the, the B'nai Yisrael, even though they, are turning aside unto Elohim, Ahirim, other gods, and have been, and then it describes them as involved in the Baal cult, worshiping other gods, as, as those who are lovers of these uh, sacred uh, raisin cakes, evidently, some particular uh, choice food item that uh, was uh, uh, used in, in uh, these uh, uh, festivals. And, uh, but, but that's the picture. Now, the, the alternative uh, to the, the view that this is Gomer and that Hosea is being told to take her back from whatever condition she had uh, fallen into in being separated from him. The alternative to that is uh, that uh, uh, now here is a, a woman who has a husband and, and uh, who is mar married to someone who, who loves her and yet she's unfaithful to that husband and now God is telling Hosea to go and join in this sin against that innocent husband by taking that. Right? that now this won't do. Okay, uh, the, the, whatever problems there are in, in having God tell Hosea to go and marry the, the, the uh, prostitute or someone who had a propensity to that, uh, 
uh, that we can handle. But, but uh, the, the, this one there, that God should go and tell him to sin against this other innocent uh, husband in, in uh, furthering the adulteries of his uh, unfaithful wife, that, that, that's unacceptable. And uh, so definitely this is Gomer. Everything points in that uh, direction. The whole analogy of what uh, God's dealings with Israel demands that God was ready to take Israel uh, uh, back and, uh, and uh, that that's what Hosea must be prepared to do. Well, how, how bad was the, the, the separation? Was there an, an actual divorce that had taken um, place? And uh, had she remarried uh, someone else? Remember, we're back there, there, there was the verse where we had to try to settle the Harishon, where she said, I was better off with, uh, with my first husband, was it? Uh, 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 and I was better off then than now, or uh, was it I will I will return to my husband as it was at the first uh, because it was better off. So there was a question already we raised back there, whether there is explicit reference to some other husband that Gomer had been married to after her separation from uh, uh, from Hosea. Uh, assuming for argument's sake now that there uh, that there there was an actual divorce that had taken place. Uh, then the problem that we encounter in terms of other biblical legislation uh, that would uh, seem to be uh, uh, trampled on is uh, then the law in Deuteronomy 24, uh, which, uh, you know, as you recall, the opening verses of, of that, where if, if the, the wife uh, then has gone and she's uh, been married to someone else, she's, she's been divorced, she's been given the bill of divorce when she goes to marry someone else and then that other party dies or, or whatever, then that you would still the first husband who gave her the bill of divorcement after she's been remarried and so on again, uh, cannot uh, take her back. And uh, so in this case, we'd be saying that uh, conceivably uh, that that was being ignored here and the thought that uh, Hosea should take back uh, uh, Gomer if in fact there had been a, 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 a not just some sort of informal separation, but actually a, a, a bill of divorce. Uh, Jeremiah 3 is something you, you want to look at in this connection. It, it begins with a citation of the Deuteronomy 24 thought that would someone take back the wife uh, in such a, a situation? Uh, no, you, that would be contrary to the law. And, and yet a few verses later on, it actually, uh, the Lord actually says, and I gave to Israel a bill of divorcement and sent them away. So uh, the, 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 that you're going to have to figure in here. The Jeremiah, I guess it's the eighth verse, if I recall, in, uh, in Jeremiah 3, where the Lord says he actually gave this Israel of the divorcement. So if, uh, if, if that's a decisive for what's going on in the Hosea case, and, and there actually was a divorce, and, and, uh, and, and conceivably a, 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 another husband who's lived and died or whatever we have to assume there, uh, then how to handle it. And uh, well, when I first wrote my article on intrusion ethics in the Westminster Journal 98 years ago, uh, <laughs> <laughs> along with uh, the uh, negative features of an intrusion judgment, huh? Uh, like uh, the Holy War and, uh, and so on, I, I included a, an intrusion of, of a positive uh, the New Testament realities in the form of, of grace that ignores the, the normal provisions, the, the thought that, that uh, the Holy Son of God goes forth and, and for a bride he takes this contaminated, uh, uh, defiled bride, this, this company is of, of sinful, defiled human beings as, as his, his bride, and that's uh, not the, the, what you would expect, but this is the intrusion of grace, which, which uh, uh, disrupts or, or contradicts the normal ways of, uh, of doing things, and I, I cited this then as a, a possible instance where normal legal provisions uh, then would be bypassed in, in the interest of an intrusion of of a grace, and I suppose if uh, I, I had to at this point uh, explain uh, the, the, such a situation that there'd actually been a bill of divorcement and, and so on, uh, that's uh, the, the, the intrusion principle is the one I would invoke uh, again to try to account for it in, in, in the interest of the, the harmonization of, of, uh, of, of scripture. So those are the possibilities that you 
can uh, be, be thinking about. But then meanwhile, here is uh, where we are, that uh, Hosea is to take back uh, uh, Gomer. And uh, he is to do that uh, in, in spite of, of her behavior as one who, while beloved of, of him, her husband, uh, has been guilty uh, as this, the preceding AA sections in first chapter and the second chapter uh, have brought out. She's been uh, guilty of, of, uh, of this way, wayward life. And uh, now then, we, we come on to verse 2. And uh, certainly here we are now in, in the, the, the B section of, of the account. And we know by the time we get down to verse 5 that we are in the New Covenant. In fact, now we have uh, uh, it's, uh, the, the eschatological end of things defines what's going on in verse 5. And uh, 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 verse 1 has been about, that's been about the, the Old Covenant of Israel, huh? And the whole s sequence that we followed in, in the first two cycles would, would point us to the fact that in between those two, uh, the, there is the thought then of judgment. That's what we expected to, to find here, the theme of judgment, which has been portrayed specifically in, the, in terms of, of exile, of uh, the separation of God's people from all that had constituted the fullness and abundance of their covenant life in the, the theocratic land when they were thrown off into uh, Babylon, dispersed to the ends of, of the heaven. That's, that's what we would expect to be here. But the symbolism doesn't seem to, uh, to be fitting because the symbolism is that of reunion, marriage reunion. That we would think would be the symbol for a new covenant, uh, but uh, uh, not so. Uh, so let's uh, look then at the uh, verses, verse 2. The first verb there uh, is best taken as a pain gun verb, not car. Uh, which has been found uh, cognate languages as well, I think, in, in, in Aramaic and Ugaritic both. Uh, the verb nakar, which, which has the meaning of, well, actually, I think to, to pay a price for a, a wife, but also in the more general sense of, of to uh, acquire authority over, um, to acquire authority o over something. <coughs> And uh, that, that meaning seems to fit here quite well. Uh, and so it's the, the imperfect first singular. <clears throat> and so the, the Lord has commanded him, go love a wife, which in effect is uh, go take, take a wife in, 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 in marriage. And in this case, of course, it's, it's Gomer, it's, uh, to take her back, <clears throat> which indeed the word owed in verse one suggests yet again, uh, go and love that wife. You loved her once, you took her in marriage once, go again now and, <coughs> and, and, and take her back. <coughs> and so Nakar would be answering to that. Now what kind of, possibly what kind of a condition had she, fall, had she fallen into some sort of economic slavery as a result of her loose life that, that uh, he, he uh, had to uh, uh, buy her back, pay some redemption price uh, uh, for her. Um, so that's the way it is usually taken, and, and perhaps probably the right way. Let me just mention at this point an alternative a suggestion that has been made in an article in recent years was that, that the whole picture then is not one of uh, Hosea's paying some price to someone else to acquire uh, Gomer back, uh, but that it's the paying of a bridal, uh, it's a bridal gift. Uh, uh, that, that he gives uh, to uh, to Gomer, so that he is not purchasing her back, but the, the, this, this is is the the, the the gift, and so he is recommitted to, to provide her with those provisions which he had always been providing, which which he wouldn't recognize, but now he's ready to do it again, and he gives her uh, a, a bridal gift. That would be an, another way of of understanding uh, this, but I think the more usual way that uh, he has to purchase her by uh, giving a 
a, a, a price to someone else who somehow has uh, gotten some uh, economic uh, uh, hold on her is, is, uh, is the likely one, although that other one would have interesting uh, possibilities too. So I, I acquired her to myself and, and now the the amount that was involved for how whether it's a payment to someone else or it's a bridal price to her is, is described. So I acquired her to myself, see the the league. Huh? To she is mine now again. Now she left, but now she is mine again. Uh, and uh, the price was now fifteen pieces of silver, an omer of barley. And then this word, which we're not sure what it means, latex or aim, and the Septuagint treats it as a as a jug of wine. The 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 usual way of taking it here is some sort of a a measure comparable to omer, so that it would be maybe an omer and a half of barley, whatever there there there's some measure of barley as well as the fifteen pieces of of silver that that are 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 mentioned. So that's uh, verse 2. And uh, now we've got to see how uh, verse, what is described in verse 3 links on to what we had in, in uh, verse 2, but also then uh, uh, ties in very definitely what we have in, in uh, verse uh, uh, 4. Now verse 3 then, says, and, and I said to her, now she's his, hmm? and, and he's the one who is uh, stipulating what this arrangement is going to be like. There is a, a marriage reunion that has taken place. What are the terms of it? What's this marriage going to be like? And uh, here's the point now that, that uh, helps to, to solve the problem of how reunion can be uh, symbolic of exile. It's a reunion but only up to a point. Not a full reunion. The marriage relationship is not to be consummated anew. And I said uh, unto her, for many days, now this of course becomes a key phrase in, in, in uniting verse three with verse four, many days. And not only the many days, but the verb yasha, which goes in it, which uh, it would well, let's suggest we're trans you, will, you will dwell, you will continue. So for, for many days, I said unto her, Yamim Rabim, for many days, Teshavili, you will continue with me. All right? So verse 2 had said, he took, uh, I took her to myself. Now he says to her, for many days you are going to continue, Lee. Huh? This relationship where, where you are mine once again is it, going to uh, continue and it's going to continue for many days. And during these many days, lo, Tisni, you will not be like the first time when you were unfaithful and you, you committed whoredom uh, while you were my wife. You're not going to be doing that this day. You're going to continue in my house and in this relationship under my authority, and you will not be going astray. And now the next uh, line uh, is uh, bristling with questions too as as to just exactly how to handle it. Uh, lo tisni we lo tihi le ish. Now is that just repeating what we just had? Uh, you will not be committing unfaithfulness. Yes, you will not be to le ish. Now here's that word ish again with uh, again the question, is it her husband or is it just some other man? Now, if it's just repeating the thought of lo tis ni, then it's some other man. So you are not going to go astray. You're not going to uh, have relationships uh, with uh, some o o other man. Uh, but I, I think that once again, as we, we've uh, seen it throughout, the Ish is her husband. Hmm? Uh, and uh, here's where there is the limitation now being put upon uh, the, their uh, marriage reunion. Uh, you won't be going astray. But even within our own relationship, one to the other, you will not be to your husband. We, the, the marriage bed will uh, not be there for them to be shared by them. You will not be uh, to your husband. It will be a reunion, but a, a limited uh, one. 
Okay, so it's a it's a mixed metaphor there for you. You get it's marriage, re, it's reunion, which isn't quite re reunion. And then now you begin to see the possibilities for interpreting uh, this experience somehow in, in terms of of, uh, of the exile. But uh, first, then we also have to finish this difficult uh, third verse because uh, the last clause is also rather uh, uh, cryptic. Vigam ani elayik. The words are short and simple, uh, but what does it mean? And also, I unto you. And also, I unto you. It's a question of, uh, of what that pairs with. And uh, let's pair it with what has just gone before. You will not be to your husband. You won't be uh, with a, a full marriage relationship to your husband. And, uh, and of course, from my side, the same thing will be true. And also, I will not be unto you. So there will not be this kind of union from uh, either uh, side. And uh, that I, I, I tend to favor as, uh, as the, the, the best way of treating the thing. And uh, so we, we get a, a reunion, as I say, which is limited now. While we're at it, though, the, uh, and maybe in some of your English translations, uh, the, I think I noticed that the NIV picked up on an interpretation that was presented uh, by uh, a commentary by Freeman and Anderson, I, I think, where, the, where they suggested that the meaning of Yashav, uh, which I, I was taking here, that you will continue, you will dwell for many days now with me in this particular situation, uh, can have the meaning to wait for something, to wait for. And uh, so let's try to plug that translation in and, and see how the verse comes out. Uh, then uh, I said to her, for many days, you will wait for me, uh, and, and you will not be committing unfaithfulness, and uh, not will you be to a man, and then they take Wigam Ani Elaik as climactic. For, for many uh, days, there, there will be some sort of a, a, a separation that is taking. You see, they're trying to get the idea of separation into the, uh, this picture rather than uh, too much of a reunion. And so the, the, the Yasha is, for, for many days you will be waiting for me. Uh, and then at last, that's the way they take Wigam Ani as climactic. And then at last, I will be unto you. In other words, uh, the exile will take place. That will go out for many times. And then at last, new covenant. See, that they're, they're jumping ahead already in verse 4 to what we're going to get in verse 5 of the new covenant. And then at last, I, I will be, be unto you. So the, there's another whole way of handling it. But that's why I was suggesting then that the connection of verse 3 with the Lee in verse 2 is, is pointing different. It's not so much waiting for me as you are going to be uh, under my authority. You are going to continue as it's mine. Uh, but the, these are the possibilities, and you're going to have to uh, set in your own mind. So I'm opting for the, the, the thought, then, that uh, he's going to continue for many days under his authority, not going astray, but also not consummating the marriage that is uh, between them. Now then, uh, uh, what does that symbolize? Verse 4 tells you very plainly what, what uh, this kind of a mixed uh, halfway reunion symbolizes. You continue many days, uh, wife of mine, in, in this condition because Israel is going to continue many days in such a condition. <coughs> so here, here the, uh, the parallel is, is, is uh, plainly stated. There's no question about it. Verse 4 picks up on the Yamim Rabim, the many days. And it picks up also on the Yashav, and uh, it uh, should be rendered then, for many days the Bnei Yisrael are going to continue our, our dwell in, in, a, in, in circumstances where what? Ain, 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 the negative there will not be, there is not ain, ain, ain. There's nothing that is characterized there. Their life back in Canaan will be true of them anymore. It's a, it's a very clear description of their exile, precisely in terms uh, that uh, have, have been used in the preceding cycles, where they will be cut off from everything that was uh, was uh, characteristic of life back in home. All of its institutions, uh, the royal court, the priestly things, 
the legitimate and the illegitimate, they're all listed here in, in verse 4. And, uh, and, and you will dwell for many days without a king. Hmm? All right, that, that was certainly true during the, the, the exile, the, the end of the, uh, the royal dynasties there. And without a prince, the whole apparatus, institution of the royal court, the, their independent uh, monarchical system will be done away. Moreover, the priestly, the cultic, will not be there. Whatever they had in Canaan, whether uh, of genuine Yahweh cult or, or Baal cult, uh, the, 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 there won't be any more. There will no longer be sacrifice there in Babylon. And, and uh, there will no longer be the Matseba pillars, the sacred uh, pillars, nor will there be the Ephod and the Teraphim. And so some of these things uh, could be characteristic of the true cult or the false cult or, or, or both. And, and in fact, uh, it's a picture of, of totality. It, it, everything is going to be gone. Cultic, cultural, legitimate, illegitimate, they won't be there in, in Canaan anymore. They're going to be in exile. So there's no question about it. Verse 4 is describing exile, and verse 4 is a, a description of the, the meaning of this symbolic relationship that has been described in verse 2. Now, there it is. Uh, and uh, so this leaves us then with a passage that is giving us some understanding of what it was like that Israel was in exile. What was their relationship to the God of the Covenant while they were in, in uh, exile? And uh, there were two tracks. The one track was that the works covenant had been violated. They were cut off. They were not God's people. And so exile uh, was the, the, the punishment for that. It, it was separation. And that corresponds to the fact that you will not be to your husband. Uh, there, there, there won't be a, a consummating of, of the marriage or relationship. There's the negative uh, aspect of the thing. But what's the reunion aspect of it, huh? Why, why tell him to go marry her again? Why have reunion of, of any kind? Because the Abrahamic covenant had not been annulled. The Abrahamic covenant was still in track. Underneath that upper layer of works, there was still the grace. There was still the future. The thing that verse 5 was going to pick up on presently and tell you about the new covenant, the consummating of, uh, of the whole thing. And so the reunion symbolism tells us that even during the exile, that God was mindful of the Abrahamic covenant. Hmm? Uh, the, the, it seems then like a, a strange symbol because of its mixture, because of the connection of, of reunion with exile. Uh, but if you're aware of, of the full covenantal analysis of what's going on, you can explain it. And if you're not aware of that full covenantal analysis, that two-track system, you're going to be at a total loss to uh, account for this, uh, uh, this type of, of, uh, of symbolism. Uh, so that's the way... That, that, that's why this passage uh, I, I find attractive as, as one which in, in terms of the whole symbolism of the thing brings out the, the, this uh, reality of the, the two aspects of, of what is going on. So the Lord does remember he, uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant which is uh, still in, in place and uh, let's bring that out Hosea by at least having a, a reunion so to, to bring out the thought that I haven't forgotten Israel while well, it's, it's in exile. The promises are still there. They will be fulfilled. And verse 5 tells us uh, then positive terms of that. So afterwards, huh? So you have Yamim Rabim for many days. That whole experience of, uh, of, of the diaspora of, of Israel leading up to the new covenant. But then afterwards, and so the fifth verse begins with Acher and it ends with Ba'acherit Hayamim and so bracketed uh, between those two formulae are, are, uh, is a picture of the eschatological age of the New Covenant. Afterwards, uh, now, Yashuvu from Shu. Afterwards, the B'nai Yisra, the, the children of Israel, will re return. And, uh, of course, meanwhile, uh, they have become, in effect, Gentiles. As we said yesterday, they've broken down the middle wall of partition. That, that they've been lost in, in that world and, and absorbed with 
the, the Gentiles, and, uh, and, but the, the, they will be brought uh, back in afterwards. The Bnei Yisrael will return. They will seek unto Yahweh, their God, up above. It had been said that they were seeking unto Baal, and they, they would be frustrated and, and so on. But uh, now they're seeking the proper uh, uh, object of devotion, their true husband, uh, unto Yahweh, their, their God. And now more of that prophetic idiom uh, as this final cycle describes the new covenant it, it picks up now definitely on the monarchy and on David hmm? as we've seen everything from the exodus to the wilderness experience to the Sinai covenant to the conquest to the settling in the land but up to, to the monarchy to David and then of course the re return from Babylonian exile but here it's David very emphatically the, the messianic uh, symbol here the royalty of Christ. You, you will come seeking unto the Lord your God and unto his beloved anointed son, here called David, in terms of the type, and unto David their king. And, and uh, then the thought of their, their reverent, o obedient uh, recognition of the Lord. They, they will literally fear unto the Lord. They will come with an appropriate attitude of reverence uh, to the Lord and unto Tuvo, his goodness, that's a term that's used for the covenant blessings, uh, and, and, and which uh, they will be finding in the new covenant, uh, and unto the, the blessings of the covenant, at the end of, of the days. And so there is the uh, picture of, of the new covenant, and uh, thus Hosea, in uh, these three chapters, very clearly has uh, been performing that double role. He's been uh, the, the lawsuit and he had the very language of Reed at the beginning of chapter 2. He's been conducting the lawsuit, the work arrangement, <coughs> threatening them with exile, but he's also heralding the, the new covenant and, uh, and Jose has been doing it in his own marriage experience, uh, uh, very much in terms of this reu reunion there, this uh, uh, reunion where, which uh, it reminds the Israelites that, that, that God is still aware of his promises, that they, they haven't been annulled. Well, that, I think, uh, is what we want to say about Hosea 1 through 3. Any points of question or discussion on that? Uh, left you with, with some exegetical questions where we weren't dogmatic. And, and, uh, and, uh, but I, I think you're at, I'd end up with whichever road I took on some of those questions with, with this same essential interpretation. If there are no questions, we can take a five-minute uh, break here before we move on. And what we're going to be moving on to then, as I said the other hour, is for a change of pace, uh, and instead of moving directly into uh, uh, another treatment from the 8th century of the whole business of the reeve and the lawsuit in, in Isaiah, we'll, we'll uh, hold out for later and see how time works out. But meanwhile, we don't. Uh, we, we want to have enough time to deal with the questions of eschatology and millennialism that come up in Daniel and so on. So we'll start there next hour.